And tonight, um, the Modern is honored to once again collaborate with Fort Worth um, AIA in conjunction with their 2018 Design Awards. Um, our collaboration has become an annual affair, um, and this year it has been uh, a true pleasure to work with Steve Klein, um, who, ha uh, as the chair of the 2018 Design Awards, brought, um, has brought Hans Butzer, um, AIA architect and director of the University of Oklahoma College of Architecture, as this year's lead juror, and as a result, the presenter for tonight's Tuesday evening presentation, which he has titled, um, I think very aptly, Architecture is a Social Act. So uh, my appreciation goes out to Steve for his thoughtfulness and his diligence in this role. And with that, I'm going to turn the lectern over to him so that he can fully introduce our distinguished speaker and explain more about tonight's program. Thank you again for being here. Well, thank you so much, Terry. Um, and as Terry had mentioned, AIA Fort Worth is most appreciative about our partnership with the Modern that has gone on for um, many years. And we're very fortunate um, to have this, this partnership. And b before I um, you know, get into the program and introduce Hans, I would also like to do a few thank yous. Um, um, this is just such a wonderful place to be. And I'm sure you know, those of us that are in Fort Worth are, are so lucky to be, to be able to enjoy the modern. And of course, I would like to thank Terry um, for all her work in, in getting this done and doing it, and Amy Cordosa and John Knuckles, and really the general staff of the modern, who has just treated us all so very well, um, make us, has made us all feel very much at home. And we um, greatly appreciate that. And I encourage you all to take advantage of the programs that um, you know, Terry has mentioned. Um, the Modern is really a world-class institution that we are so lucky to have here in Fort Worth. And so I hope you all will partake in the many programs and things that the, that the Modern has to offer. Um, next, I would also like um, to thank the Design Awards Committee. Um, you know, these events take a lot of effort and a lot of people in order to um, get, them, get them done. And so I would like to thank um, David Lee, who's our past chair, and thank him for all the hel his help on, on, on this year as well. Uh, Chad Davis, Brandon Burns, Amy Stensler, David Stanford, Bart Shaw, Lonnie Burns, Stuart Everett, Mata Rosenich, and um, especially would like to give a special thanks to our executive director, uh, Alicia Natalzella. And really, with, Alicia is really the fabric that holds all of us together. Um, with the AIA, the positions over the years will change, and people will change committees and things. So, so it's really, really important to have an ex executive director to give us um, continuity. And also, Alicia does this with um, Mackenzie Cox. Um, who also um, contributes greatly um, to the AIA Fort Worth. Um, after the lecture, um, we will have, um, as Terry mentioned, the Design Award programs, which recognizes outstanding architectural, urban design, and unbuilt projects by architecture, by architects, excuse me, practicing in the Fort Worth chapter. And basically with this program, we hope to promote a more public interest in design excellence. And that's really one of the things that uh, with the AII, AII that you know, we hope, hope to do and to involve the community and involve community involvement, which is so important to, to, to good architecture. And again, we are you know, pleased to have um, Hans here uh, today. And you know, Hans is an architect, and he's also dean of the University of Oklahoma College of Architecture. And um, Hans, um, and I think one of the things that distinguishes Hans is, is being both involved in practice and a pragmatist, as well as an educator. And, um, and Hans, with his wife and partner, Tori, is best known as the co-designer of the internationally acclaimed Oklahoma City National Memorial. And for those of you that haven't had the opportunity to head up I-35 to Oklahoma City, I really encourage you to um, visit, uh, visit the memorial. It really is an outstanding piece of architecture. And the American Institute 
Institute of Architects, and I'm going to quote um, from Hans's 2016 National AIA Thomas Jefferson Award. I think they said it better than, than I could say it. Um, Hans's impact on Oklahoma City is profound. Having designed the Oklahoma City National Memorial and other landmark projects in his city, like the Oklahoma City Skydance Bridge, Butzer is a gifted and accomplished architect who has built his career in Oklahoma City by dedicating himself to improving the built landscape and enriching the fundamental civic di dignity of the city. And um, this is the part I like best. He's, he is a true citizen architect, a practitioner and educator that demonstrates throughout his work that architecture can enhance communities and cities. And on a personal note, um, I, I became aware of Hans's work um, quite some time ago um, because of the emotional impact of, that the architecture actually had on people's lives. And most importantly, it's, it's power of healing. You know, a lot of people don't think about architecture as art or having the ability to heal, but the Oklahoma City Memorial um, certainly does that. Um, for those of you that might not be aware, my wife Susan is a, a survivor of the Oklahoma City bombing. And as a result of that, um, you know, has had involvement um, with, with the Oklahoma City site. And then also myself in, in my career um, as a former Regional Historic Preservation Fine Arts Officer of uh, GSA, I retired recently, um, was involved in the maintenance of the, the site there. So, so there's a, we have a real connection to it, and then having de dealt with other survivors, and you know the impact that it really had on, on Oklahoma City, um, the memorial, you know, for me uh, with the architecture, you know, stands right up there with you know certainly the Vietnam Memorial and 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 architecture that has the ability to heal and bring people together, and finally, I just wanted to. Congratulate Hans and his firm. They've just received um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation um, Award for their work on Douglas at Page Woodson Apartment Community. And it was one of uh, three, only three award winners of 2018 from the National Trust. And for those that aren't aware of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, it's considered one of the highest honors to receive one of their national awards. And it was a former school and gathering place for African-American community in uh, northeast Oklahoma City. And the building had faced neglect and fallen into disrepair prior to its rebirth and rehabilitation. So um, now I'd like to um, invite Hans to come up. It's with great pleasure to talk about um, architecture is a social act. So thank you. And Hans Uh, thank you, Steve. Thanks to uh, AI Fort Worth and to the Modern. We've been uh, well taken care of, uh, and I think I speak on behalf of my fellow jurors as well. That you know, you, you guys have been great hosts, uh, and boy, what a what a place to celebrate architecture and art. Um, so I'd uh, like to walk you through some of our work, um, and and present it under this notion that architecture is a social act. And you know, most of the time when we talk about architecture, we talk about it in terms of form. We talk about shadow, tone, light, and so forth. Ultimately, you know, it's our position that uh, everything, all of the work that we do has to be framed through the experience of people, whether it's an individual or a community. And I'd like to uh, kind of share a little bit more about, uh, and touches a little bit upon uh, Steve's introduction earlier, um, you know, I do live a very complicated life, and I'm very fortunate to have the most amazing wife and partner uh, to, to help uh, shape that life. And, and, um, but ultimately, you know, to, to design architecture the way we certainly try to do, we approach it more than just architects, but as, as citizens. Uh, it's first as people. It's about empathy. It's about dignity. And, and seeing how our skills can lift uh, others. Um, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my parents, and that sounds like a kind of a corny way to start a presentation, um, but, uh, but it's, it's so true. And um, 
you know, I, I really love this photo of them. It's 1974, and you can tell by my dad's sideburns uh, and the, just the overall garbs here that uh, we were big Rolling Stones fans when I was a kid growing up. And, you know, my dad was also a teacher. We had the wildest graduate student parties. Um, I was uh, eight at the time. I, I wasn't fully aware of just how much fun these parties were. All I knew was my job was to keep putting on a new Stones album and refilling the punch of Bullfrog, which is a delicious combination of vodka and limeade. Now, but more importantly than this, uh, my parents uh, are, were uh, geographers and anthropologists. And so they viewed the world uh, through uh, people and their relationship to the landscape. Our childhood was not marked by field trips. It was marked by, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, vacations, but rather we did field trips. Um, and back then, it was no fun, I guarantee you. In retrospect, I realized, wow, I was a lucky boy. But this is the backdrop to the life that my parents lived. Right? They, were, um, they came from far western Germany, Köln, Bonn, Aachen, uh, Mülheim, Ruhr. And uh, fortunately, my father's family fled Germany in 1937. Uh, they were wholly opposed to what they saw uh, coming on. They fled over England, spent a few years in a, a German a prisoner of war camp, and then made it to Montreal in 1941. And that's where he uh, advanced his studies. My mother, on the other hand, uh, spent a good part of her childhood in a bomb shelter in the basement of Bonn, just down the Rhine River from here. Um, but but for, for both of them, you know, they, they started to think of the world in terms of you know, how we relate to community, how we relate to our landscapes. And you know, this notion of nationalism was an everyday conversation in my house. You know, there are good forms of nationalism, and there are other forms of nationalism where you have to be a little bit more suspicious. But they always recognized that it's this fine line between our identity and how we relate to others, whether, it's, whether we view them as others or whether we, we view them as a part of us. Right? And it's a very important distinction. It's one that had a huge impact on me. And then there's the question of symbol, things that, that we rally around as communities, who designs those and who is who is to be included in these national symbols. The other big impact uh, of my parents was the, uh, the writings of Richard Halliburton. Ha is anyone familiar with Richard Halliburton? Yeah, we got a Halliburton fan. All right, I love it. So, and, and the irony here is, you know, my father, my, both my parents are avid readers. But the house is full of books. He's a professor. And uh, the one thing I did not enjoy doing was reading. And so my father actually paid me $10 uh, to read this book right here, Richard Halliburton's Complete Book of Marvels. And it changed my life. I mean, it was such an inspiring story about traveling the world and seeing the world through other structures, right? I mean, ar architecture is also culture, right? And to be able to see how others view the world, how they want to anchor themselves to the world, and that book right there, 19, uh, early 30s, was an absolute uh, time travel, a real game changer for me. And so for our family, it was all about this mixed identity, Germany and North America. Uh, and certainly, we've ended up in uh, just up the road here in Oklahoma, although I admit I am a Longhorn. Um, but this was kind of this uh, kind of interesting dance that we've always got to play. In, in many ways, whenever we're in the States, we always feel ourselves, we're, we're more German. And whenever we go to Germany, uh, everyone picks up, hey, your accent's a little different. Well, I'm an American. So it gives us this position of objectivity. Right? We always get to toggle a little bit. And, and through that objectivity, continue to explore this question of identity, of place, and the role that we, people, the community, has in placemaking. So my childhood was kind of crossed these three key zones, uh, Aachen, Germany, um, Wisconsin, which where we took a lot of field trips as a kid, looking at the Kettle Moraine landscapes, trying to visualize the, the, ice, the, the uh, Laurentian lobe, the glaciers kind of peeling back and creating these beautiful uh, landscapes. And then Chicago, where we spent about 17 years. And so, of course, there you get, you're exposed to Frank Lloyd Wright and just great history, great traditions of architecture. And so that was, that was the other part of, of my world. 
So let's get back to architecture as a social act. So I did not invent this term or this expression, this uh, whatever we want to call it. It actually comes from Spiro Kostov, which some of you read. Um, great, great uh, 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 book in, of history. Um, but really, the, 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 the more important part is actually what follows, right? It's social in method and purpose, right? So it's not just why we're building, but also how we build, OK? Um, and you know, to, you know, Steve, you're so kind to, to talk about these awards and recognition and talk about Hans, this, blah, blah, blah. Every architect, raise your hand if you're an architect. Raise your hand. Come on. Is, it, is it a one man or one woman show? Not at all, right? And so, I mean, it is a purely a collaborative social engagement. It is a social act in its method as well as its purpose. And I think it's very important that we all think of that. But the other really beautiful part of of Kostoff's book is what happens after the colon. He talks about settings and rituals. And that is ultimately what we're doing here, right? Every Tuesday, right? We, we join here. Hopefully, everyone's coming back, right, regularly to the modern for these uh, usually good lectures. Um, but, but this idea of settings and rituals, again, kind of suggests uh, culture, it suggests traditions, things that we do again and again because they are a part of who we are, part of how we engage place and identity. And then the last kind of part of my prefix here is uh, kind of this uh, tripartite of, of who I view as of, of kind of theoretical rock stars in architecture that have, have always resonated with me, uh, Vitruvius, Gottfried Zempa, and Kenneth Frampton. And from those three, I, I've actually, uh, and it was interesting to kind of finalize this slide um, to, to realize the pieces that I'm most interested in kind of work across the three columns. Uh, program, as I get older, I begin to realize that programming is, is really more important than anything to some extent in architecture. It's people, why we build, okay? And then it's about the hearth, right? We're trying to anchor people, right? It's about that Z axis. And lastly, it's about topography, right? It's this cultural, uh, uh, topography. It's, it's more than just what the landscape, the ground is doing under our feet. It's about political forces, socioeconomic forces. That is the topography of our, it's our context, right? And so none of the, the anchoring, none of the people takes place without context. And so ultimately, uh, our work, the issue that we're continuing to explore as part of our practice, BAO, uh, is this idea of anchoring, right? It's trying to, to, to create architecture, use these tools of, of structure uh, through beautiful means to help anchor people in their place. And so that's really the, the overall piece that I'll, I'll be talking about here in a few minutes. As I mentioned before, everything is a collaboration. Uh, that is Tori, amazing Tori. Uh, we design everything together, uh, everything together. Um, and you know, we've been a part of a practice that just ebbs and flows. Um, you know, this is, this is the day I first became director. And then you see this drop off. Um, and then around here, I became the dean. And now I'm in this place of, of absolute stress as we're trying to hire. Uh, you just can't, there are not enough architects in this country right now to hire. I can't, uh, it's crazy. But uh, anyways, it's all about collaboration, folks. This is some of our team, very proud of our team. I just want to mention a couple things in terms of uh, my, my role, uh, my obsessions at OU. Uh, the first was finally in 2014, after about 14 years of effort, establishing the OU Design Center in downtown Oklahoma City, trying to find a way to bring all that our college, right, one of the few that has architecture and planning and landscape and interior design, environmental design, construction science, and of course architecture to the community. Right? Norman, it's, it's a little bit of far away, it's a little bit Arlington, right? a little bit of a, 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 a drive. So uh, establishing that design center was really important to me. And then the other part is the Oklahoma City Studio, which uh, I ran in part with Tori at times from about 2001 to 2014. And those circles, circled areas are actually parts of the city that are now in construction or have been built based on the work that we did with our students. You know, Using that place of privilege, and it is a privilege to be a teacher, to create studio product projects that don't have an architect behind them yet, don't have a developer behind them yet, but allow us to simply project, plant ideas very unassumingly, 
and then hopefully present them in a way that, that really gains traction. And uh, uh, there's been a lot of traction so far. Um, and it, and it, uh, we've created about $250 million in just in architecture fees for firms in uh, Oklahoma City doing work as a result of that OKC studio. So now is, uh, you know, I'm going to share a few projects. This just gives you an idea of some of the work that we do. It's a wide range. We do, as Steve mentioned, historic preservation. We do cultural work, residential, new, old, commercial, you name it. Uh, we do also a lot of uh, uh, master planning, comprehensive designs. We love teaming up with uh, planning firms um, and uh, just allows us to have different levels of impact. But these diagrams here start to uh, uh, kind of foreshadow the seven projects I'm going to touch upon. And all of them are presented within this kind of framing of uh, how we uh, uh, engage this question of uh, architecture being a social act. And um, so hopefully these diagrams will mean more as we walk along. Um, first, of course, is the Oklahoma City National Memorial. Uh, it's all about framing a, a place within a moment in a community. Uh, but this is why, uh, why we had to build uh, what we built, uh, this horrific tragedy, 168 uh, people who died, 165 were in the building, three were outside the building. It's part of an international competition. On the left is, is the Murrah building uh, prior to. It had won an AIE award uh, about 15 years earlier. Um, but um, I share just a few uh, images. Uh, Albert, if you're, you're in here somewhere, Albert probably recognizes one of these drawings. Uh, this is an analytique drawing that I prepared. Um, along the way, kind of simultaneously overlaying different viewpoints and details as we developed our design. Far left is one of Tori's amazing pencil and watercolor renderings that was phase two of the competition. And these are some of the, the, the built pieces, but ultimately it's all about scale. It's about placing people in a moment. The gates are the key moments or elements of structure that help define the space, help uh, basically give people uh, an anchoring from which to enter the site and then to understand how you frame the site of everything that happened there at, at 902. 901 is inscribed on the east gate and 903 on the west gate, just to remind people of the, uh, the historical as well as the literal context uh, of the moment in which the bomb went off. And again, certainly invite you all to come up if you haven't been yet. Uh, you can always reach me through OU or our office if you'd like a tour. Uh, this next project uh, came on the heels of, of finishing the memorial, and it started by uh, our neighbor coming across the street, and he proceeded first to, to tell me how, how much he liked the memorial and how much his wife really didn't like it at all. I mean, it was like, wow, that's a, that's a really interesting way to start a conversation in the street. Um, but then he followed up and said, you know, well, you wouldn't happen to want to design a church, would you? Of course, how many architects don't want to design a place of worship or spirituality, right? Um, but this was really interesting, and it, and it was a project that allowed me to tap into so much of my childhood and my parents' interests in anthropology in particular, you know, this kind of the identity of a people and how they uh, 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 manifest aspects of their identity by the way they, they make things and leave things behind. But the uh, first client me and started literally like this, uh, we want this church to look like a teepee. And, uh, and so we, we took it all in and um, started to do more history. Uh, the, the key person who founded this uh, Episcopal community was actually a Cheyenne warrior, Okahara, um, who ended up uh, converting to Episcopal uh, faith. Um, and he, some of his work, his ledger art, is actually in the Smithsonian. But after 1917, they didn't, this was their last permanent facility. And, it was almost appropriate that when we started the project, uh, the, the church really was just a van, right? And how appropriate for a Plains tribe, right? The Cheyenne Arapaho are all about just moving in the landscape. But that really clued us into this idea that if we're going to build something in this community that is, is extremely poor, that has great needs, that has addiction problems, drug, uh, you just name it, all sorts of challenges in day-to-day -day life, it's important that we, we try and frame, both literally and figuratively, this project uh, through their lens. And so we spent a lot of time learning how the Cheyenne would build in their landscape. Also a lot of time spending uh, uh, learning how Watongans build in, on Main Street in Watonga, which is, uh, anyone had Watonga cheese? Anyone? Watonga cheese? Just try it. It's like a cheddar. Pretty sharp. Um, but, you know, it's, they're very basic structures. 
Um, but you can tell it's a windy place and a hot place by the you know, limited uh, uh, fenestration, very simple uh, utilitarian structures out there, um, but very much something to be respected. The site was a 10 and a half acre site, uh, fairly windswept that had this one line of trees about uh, kind of bifurcating the site. Um, and, but we took inspiration from how the Cheyenne defines space this, and, and differentiate between the sacred and the banal. And uh, you know, really started to zero in on this, the, uh, the notion that the sacred is, is only allowed within the circle and everyone else, everything else has to help define and, and back away from the circle. And so this led to uh, our overall sighting uh, and the master plan. We, we inscribed the circle in the site with a row of trees uh, helping delineate the east-west axis, and then placed this community center and church, or really a chapel, uh, just against the northern edge of those, uh, that line of trees to help protect it from wind and the hot sun. And then, of course, the banal, right, parking, uh, stays outside of that uh, circle. But it's become a very uh, important place in that community, and this is how we started to kind of you know, revise the, the, the issue instead of saying we're going to do a teepee, but rather what can we learn from the teepee. So these were some of the early uh, development drawings uh, where you begin to see a very simple skin uh, that kind of helps bind the spaces and create shelter out in the landscape. And then again, taking cues from how you uh, build in the landscape. A very important moment for the Cheyenne was the first ins really inscription into the ground to, to pour the stem walls. And then here you see the frame, right? Basically, metal buildings, right, are, are, are the modern uh, uh, shed, the modern teepee, if you will. And here, in this case, we used a um, sip. Uh, this is a wheat straw insulated sip manufactured here in northern Texas. Um, but it's basically a very inherent system where we use the sip much you, as you would use a hide. You just wrap it around the frame, in this case, a steel frame, uh, to create a very basic uh, form a shelter in its final iteration with comp shingle anchored there in the landscape against that line of trees, a very protective line of trees. Inside, very raw, right? I mean, the, the Native American, the Cheyenne, they do not uh, place great value on permanence. You know, for them, you know, the landscape, the stars, the winding rivers, that, that's what needs to be permanent. And so we really, you know, stuck with this very simple architectural expression that, that really celebrates the the basic material palette within. But again, it's all about a celebration of, of their values, their identity, as we place them in this landscape. Skydance Bridge, right? So the key to the Skydance Bridge was this letter. How often does a mayor write a letter that people would just want to cite over and over again? But he had these three bullets here. And Mick Cornett, what a great mayor. Maybe some have heard of him, but he ended up becoming the head of the Mayor's Institute uh, for a while. But um, he set out the goal for this uh, national competition, you know, to where this bridge be iconic, that it uh, reflect the vibrant qualities of Oklahoma City, and that become eventually a symbol uh, of Oklahoma City. This is more or less what the site looked like when we were getting started. Um, the, the MAPS program was uh, kind of in full tilt, but we hadn't really jumped across the highway. We hadn't removed moved the highway yet. That was part of the long-term plan, and this is that long-term plan. Uh, I was helped kind of shape this along with an amazing team of, of planners, create this core to shore park, connecting the CBD over uh, what eventually was a relocated highway down to the river. And so this pedestrian bridge played a very, very important role in connecting the city, uh, civic life, to the river, uh, but also you have to keep in mind that I-40 is also are, here you see the I-40 piece and the sighting for it. But you know, I-40 is the, kind of the modern Route 66. Um, and you know, the two things that Oklahoma does really well is, is make good use of the wind and, of course, make good use of iconic structures <laughs> on the highway. Uh, of course, the, my daughters love the Caduceus Whale. Got to love that little hat right there. It's just, uh, just great. I'm sure it says Rangers on the front. Um, <laughs> But anyways, we, you know, so we submitted, and uh, we were one of four teams to be uh, selected to submit an actual design, uh, and a design that was inspired by the state bird. And this coin had just come out uh, real, literally weeks uh, before we started developing the design. 
But we really found inspiration from the scissor tail fly, fly catcher, the Oklahoma State bird, um, both in terms of its very unique tail wing structure, how it can navigate uh, the wild winds. And you do have some scissor tails out in the Texas panhandle, by the way. Um, but also inspiring and wholly appropriate for structure was, is, is the, uh, the kind of more hollow uh, bone structure of a bird, uh, certainly a scissor tail among them, very efficient. And that kind of structural efficiency is also you know, pr pretty well aligned with structural steel, tube steel, which is ubiquitous in Oklahoma because of our um, oil, uh, booming oil business. So we, we kind of embarked on this, this idea, Toy and I. We, we found ourselves on the Galveston Beach actually watching seagulls and noting you know, how big their feet are to keep them from kind of so sinking into the sand and started to think a bit about our scissor trail flycatcher and how you know, they both have evolved according to their place, their con the conditions, their context, to become something very unique. And so we, we started to, you know, and literally this is, you know, is the first two pages of our, of our brainstorming and taking that scissor tail and immediately developing it as something that, that helped divine this kind of vertical z-axis in a very otherwise flat, uh, horizontal Oklahoma landscape. And one thing that's important to know is um, you know, people always, often joke, you know, uh, sex is often a great way to sell certain things. Um, and part of our narrative was uh, that the scissor tails mating dance, so to speak, is this V-shaped dive that the male does in the sky. He'll dive down trying to impress all the female scissor tail fly catchers. And that, that dive, that dance, is called the sky dance. And so that's actually the basis for the name of this uh, bridge. So you can tell that story at Thanksgiving this year. <laughs> um, but this, you know, we, we, you know, we built this kind of crappy little wooden model. It's kind of crumbled still on my desk right now. And then it quickly went to a, a crappy little SketchUp model. And then I, we started to put a bigger team together of people who really knew what they were doing. Um, one experience that maybe some architects in here have, have, are there any structural engineers in here, by the way? Structural engineers, no? OK. Um, well. Uh, what we found is that you know, the formulas of an engineer often can limit the discussion about structure when you're developing a design, right? The engineer says, well, I did the calcs. This is it. This is as far as we can go. And what we discovered was that depending on which engineer you ask, those calcs could lead to different conclusions, OK? I'm not saying there's any collusion here. Um, but but uh, so we decided as we assembled the team, we would have three structural engineers on our team to, just to make sure we had healthy debate, okay? And so that's really how we were able to, and I kid you not, that, that is how we were able to achieve what we did. And these three guys here were in constantly arguing. And for an architect, that's a blast to watch. <laughs> but anyways, we'd meet at 7 a.m. Uh, we put in 1,400 hours just to win the competition, okay? Uh, that is not a good business model. Um, but, you know, we are passionate about community, and we wanted to be the team to design this uh, civic icon. This is the structural model that we submitted. Uh, the original design had uh, basically was a cable stay structure. Everything is suspended or tensioned off of these two wings, if you will. Um, and this is, these are the drawings that we submitted for the competition. And then, uh, kid you not, 50% through the CDOCs, they cut the budget by 50%. Um, and then they said, but you still have to open on time. And then they, this is all true, all true. Um, so in June, uh, they cut the budget, and we had to go to bid by, uh, we had basically a year to finish construction drawings, because they had to open by December 19th the following year. And so this is the revised version, which in our view is actually much better. Um, the, the structure uh, uh, has been relieved of actually uh, so much of the work. Uh, the previous version, these wings were one inch thick plate steel. It was really, uh, uh, has a kind of a, it just feel, felt heavy. Um, uh, but with this design, we're able to really leverage steel for what it does best. And the beauty of it is it was developed in such a way that a number of Oklahoma steel companies could bid it. Um, and luckily, a, a company that literally is 1.2 miles west of this new highway actually won the job. And the entire structure was brought in by this very road. Um, so we, we had very limited embodied energy 
uh, with that. A little kink to recognize the shift in the historic grid of Oklahoma City as part of the land run. Um, way to celebrate it and help kind of give the, give the bridge a, a, a little bit of a dynamic. Uh, the tool, uh, this was the first project I had ever worked on with Grasshopper. Uh, and this was the, um, this was the, um, the um, algorithm, if you will, a bunch of switches here that, that set up the sequencing for us to develop the skin, the stainless steel skin, the feathers, as it were. Uh, of course, as any architect would want, uh, every single feather is different, all 60, 667 of them. Um, but they were set up in cut files that made fabrication very, very easy. It was very elemental in the way it was structured. And there you see it finished. Drive I-40. And we did succeed just a few years ago. Oklahoma City presented that as the new uh, logo for, for the city itself. We're still trying to get the uh, Skydance to be incorporated in the Thunders uh, logo, because we'd, we'd love to get the royalties <laughs> off of that NBA contract. Sliver, this is actually our, our own office building. We got together with uh, two other owners to buy this dilapidated little building just about five blocks west of Devon Tower. It was an amazing uh, project in the Myriad Gardens, kind of the garden of the city, uh, located in uh, Film Row, historic Film Row, which was just starting to see a renaissance. Uh, our project is right in this little gap right here. Um, and it was home to Paramount Pictures and, and uh, uh, Columbia Pictures. And this was really their hub, their intersection, where they would bring in the trains on the back alley here, whoops, right here, and unload these huge film reels into the back of all these warehouses. So all the back of every warehouse had this kind of fireproof room. And they would just unload those reels and from these warehouses, then you know, the films would be distributed throughout central Oklahoma. And that was kind of the, you know, the real beauty and the identity of this place. And so we ended up buying this uh, one-story building and contemplating what, what the, the train tracks and that history uh, could start to, to shape for us in terms of the, the narrative of anchoring this, this identity of this community uh, to this new structure. Of course, you see this beautiful, right? I mean, you would also want to buy this as soon as you saw it, right? I mean, it's just screaming beautiful, right? Elegant, you just go on and on. Um, but uh, the boxcar, of course, we start to think of this project more and more as a boxcar and, you know, the idea of just, you know, just sliding open, swinging open these doors to, uh, to frame views. Here's the before on the right, and this is where we are. Uh, today, our office and office of a couple other architecture and engineering firms are on the front, conference rooms in the back, and then upstairs is a lease or tenant space. But this, this, this move was really important. We didn't own this parking lot, but, we, uh, but the guy from whom we bought this building did. And so we, since he had already planted windows in this east facade of his uh, headquarters next door, we asked if we could build our second story in a zone where there were no windows. And, um, and so uh, we, uh, we, we had the air rights for it, and it became this very important uh, place. The, the main entry lobby is right here. And so you have this beautiful view through to the street to the south. We wanted this to really kind of promote connections between California and Sheridan, and also to create a sheltered space for films and other things that can happen. Here you see that fulcrum space, that vertical anchoring um, that helps kind of pivot the one story with the second story above. All core 10. There you see the plan with the two story up here. Very straightforward, you know, kind of boxcar type with these big windows, uh, views to downtown. Kept most of the interiors. There's the back door that they used to deliver these films through. And then here's that. Uh, that space here, and I'm just too excited here to share this. Steen Eiler Rasmussen's uh, Experiencing Architecture. Right? There's a beautiful chapter about uh, sound and the acoustics of architecture and 
So it's certainly something that we try to capture here to help define a, a community space within our own uh, world. The Oklahoma Publishing Building was part of taking an existing parking garage and trying to expand its facade. It was set back from the street. And so this project is all about kind of trying to recapture this vestige space. This was the beautiful structure when we started. You had these precast shear panels that helped with the seismic activity. This was where the publishing company was coming from, this kind of banal suburban office building. And uh, you know, there's not really much difference between that and this, right? There's not a lot of engagement uh, with the community. Uh, on the right, you see, whoops, what happened there? There we go. Um, you see here on the right, that kind of leftover, you know, it's kind of this urban ambivalence. And so for us, the big move was to see how we could uh, bring the building out to the street to better engage and to create a, a, a setting where this newspaper could return to downtown and invite the public into the newspaper's work and also help connect this, the paper back to its uh, city. But we removed these uh, seismic panels and uh, basically re re replaced the work of these panels with this exoskeleton. And that allowed us then to replace uh, uh, all those concrete panels with glass. Here's the um, structural detail, the, the kind of section in that in-between space that helps us grow our urban edge and fully engage the building. And uh, speaking of art, this was actually in, in, on the back side of that suburban building. We thought, wow, that'd be a great way to, help, again, help the building reoccupy uh, closer to the building edge there. Those are investigation, analysis, and publication. I know those are three words that everyone uses with the press these days. There are the existing building, existing atrium. You can see here on the right, this is what we inherited. This is what it became very much uh, a newsroom. There's the, the staff on the day it opened, surrounded by some of their more favored headlines over the years. And what we call the town crier. The civic, civic is all about density and, and, and placing people in a multifamily condo type affair. It's really about occupying the full site here you see it located up here, just off of downtown. Our building is here, Devon Tower, right across from the Civic Center Music Hall. It's all about two very simple bars pushed right up to the sidewalk and seeing how we can really compress that moment where a person's private life and civic life starts. And so those faces, those edges are really important. This is the Civic Center Music Hall across the street. This, the fluting here was of particular interest in us for us in terms of the shadow play and it's kind of in and out, but then you start to see here in the facade is the northern edge, the northern bar, this kind of faceted folding in and out to kind of create this lyrical edge along an otherwise quiet residential street. And then you see here the southern edge where we are a little bit more strategic and you see these very more abrupt folds that pop out, create a balcony with which to then frame views of downtown. Again, very simple move. The key structural component of the facade is all we're really manipulating to create these spaces that really, really press the people up and engaging city life. Uh, these, folks, these are the best tenants. I mean, every architect should, should want them to write a letter of recommendation. They're about to buy the, the unit above them uh, so they can have two. They love it uh, so much. And there you see the northern edge. Very simple, just trying to compress and engage the sidewalk. Last project I'll share is a project that's kind of a, a combination between our firm, a pro bono project, and the university. Uh, we re reinstated our design build program. Uh, and it starts with a site here in Northern Edge of Norman. Here's historic Norman, there's campus for all you Sooner fans. And very important to note here is the railroad, which is the reason uh, Norman exists. And this site is on the edge of a cul-de-sac right at the right next to the, to the railroad, and that helps explain that important section. Right, 
And so that, that section then really starts to drive, right? So the railroad's right here. And so the sound and the vibrations are really intense for the site. And of course, we want to create a very dignified, affordable uh, place for the Norman uh, Housing Authority to take over. And so we designed a very simple uh, pairing of duplexes, uh, kind of a shotgun setup. And you see here in the image up here, this is the section. So it's all about basically creating a back, uh, really fattened, double stud construction, staggered stud construction back uh, to the railroad and, and certainly the western setting sun as well and opening it up towards the east, creating this uh, front porch that uh, creates personal space as well as semi-public uh, space. The funnest part was actually handing over the permit drawings to our students who built it uh, this past spring, finished it up in uh, June. And in uh, September, uh, the first owners started to move in. It was all affordable, uh, all built for 106 bucks a foot. And everyone learned a whole bunch. There you see that uh, stagger stud uh, setup becoming that defining structural piece that, that gives shelter. And then using a rain screen, very simple rain screen, you know, giving a little bit of love here, cutting it down to, to three pieces, give a little bit of detail. And then here are the closing uh, images uh, the day before. We had a big party with students and the Norman Housing Authority as we handed it over. Here's that uh, porch that people have already started to occupy there on the right. Very simple interiors, very simple means, but really trying to, to again, to, to marry this, these ideas of program hearth and uh, topography uh, to define our work and to help create places for people, to anchor people in their community. So I thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm certainly open. Anyone? <laughs> any questions or comments? Anyone hate it? It's okay. No, yeah, oh yeah. Um, they mentioned earlier that you were doing a school in Northeast Oklahoma City. What was the name of the school? Yeah, Paige Woodson. Yeah. And that's a rehabilitation project that finished up about a year and a half ago. It, it was an elementary school. It's actually where Ralph Ellison went to school, um, among other amazing uh, African Americans in the Oklahoma City community. Um, but it was empty for about 20 plus years. And uh, you know, it's very not, it's not often that the, uh, architects want to celebrate developers. Uh, apologies to any developers in here, but, but it was a developer who saw this derelict building, understood its history and the potential of its redevelopment to kind of bring back this African American neighborhood. Uh, and, and really that developer should take all the credit for the success that project it has so far. And what are the actual streets that it's on? I'm from Oklahoma City. Uh, it's it's uh, basically fifth. Um, and Stonewall. If you go east on uh, 4th Street from Lincoln and go, uh, take, uh, go north on, uh, near Bryant, and it'll, it's right up there. You just see it from 4th Street up a high on a hill. It has beautiful, beautiful setting. Thank you. Yeah. You bet. You bet. Any other thoughts or questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, and now for the next programming yes. for tonight. So stay in your seats. Yes.